on the desk today is a Sony VAIO Z505 Super Slim Pro notebook computer from about April 2000. This notebook features a 12.1 inch screen with a 1024 by 768 resolution, a 12 gigabyte IDE hard disk drive, a Pentium 3 processor clocked at 650 megahertz, and an amount of RAM to be determined. computer hails from my better half's family who hoards computers almost as much as I do. And it's unclear where exactly this computer comes from or what it was used for, but it does have an Industry Canada sticker on the bottom. Don't know if that means it was manufactured in Canada or if it was used by a Canadian company, but regardless, the source is unknown. Upon booting the machine, we're met with a very pretty Sony VAIO splash screen before we start loading into Windows. Now, in this computer, of course, given its age and that this is the original drive, you can, you can hear the drive spin. And in fact, we have to skip through to get past date and time settings uh, because, of course, that battery, the CMOS battery is very, very dead. I was surprised when I opened this computer turned it on for the first time and discovered it trying to boot into Windows XP. Uh, the machine has a Windows 98 key on the bottom of it and in fact shipped back in early 2000 with Windows 98 second edition. Now, somewhat problematically, this installation of Windows XP was abandoned halfway through. So I don't have a CD drive for this because this is of course before the time that we could use a USB CD drive like we can now. And as it was a part of Sony's Super Slim lineup, there is no internal drive. Now on eBay, you can purchase the external drive for anywhere between $50 and $300 for a brand new in-box one. But there's no guarantee that it's going to work. And a lot of them, in fact, say that they're not tested. Rather than gambling on an eBay listing for an external CD drive that may or may not arrive with any sense of urgency or operation, I said I opted to call my friend Jeff and get this USB 3 to SATA and IDE cable. Although it's really more of an adapter, the thing is, is that now we need to figure out how we're gonna use this to fix this drive inside of this computer, right? And the first thing we're gonna need to do is take the drive out. Let's go there. After exiting Windows XP setup, we can go back and try to boot in to the Windows 98 installation by waiting for the bootloader to appear and very, very quickly, uh, trying to grab that. So we'll go through here and I'll say, let's boot Windows, right? But, bit of a problem. We get our startup menu, we go for normal, then it tries. <laughs> but unfortunately, we're met with a variety of errors due to missing registry files, missing configuration files, because as a part of the Windows XP setup, whomever was installing it very likely had already formatted this disk. So if I go into command prompt and I run dir, there's pretty much nothing there. So now it's time to disassemble. So first thing we'll do is we'll pop out our battery. No clue if it still works, but we'll give it a shot. Now this computer having lived through 20 plus years uh, is missing some screws. So we'll go ahead and take out all the screws from the bottom and I should probably get a tray to put them in. Tray. We'll put our screws in. All of them are the same except for a couple. Now, it really is curious how we're going to get all of this to work with this drive because I'm not sure, and you know, just due to inexperience, if Windows 98 has a graphical user interface. And of course, it's very Googleable, but where's the fun in that? Half of the fun of learning is the experimentation. Now we've got all these screws that are left out. So we're going to flip it over, actually, because this is one of those machines that opens from the top. So we'll go ahead and unlatch it. Go ahead and unlatch it. First thing, keyboard's gonna come right out. And it's got a ribbon cable underneath. Good, easy peasy, keyboard's out. Next up, we have a little heat spreader here. That just comes right out, no problem. Just sitting in there, hold. I guess there's the systems on a chip, I'm not sure. And from here, we got speaker cables and then also a ribbon over here not sure what it does, uh, but we'll carefully, as best we can, 
remove that ribbon cable out. Then we gotta get these speaker cables, and these are hard to get, because, you know, they're old. These really tiny ribbon cables, so we'll just kind of pinch them out there. Not much in the way of clips, but actually they're not ribbon cables at all. They're speaker cables. All right, got those out, cool. Next up, the mouse tray is going to lift up. That's not true. Next up, in order to remove this case, you have to remove the hinge pieces. So we'll bring the screen all the way back, and here we have two little kind of eh, hinge protectors, I guess. Uh, so we're gonna go in there as gently as we can. It's all right if we mess it up a little bit. There's one. And there's two. And we got those off. These pieces, which protect the speakers, they're gonna kind of slide off to the sides. There we go. Good. We got two more screws under here on the sides of the speakers. These are the only screws that are a different size than the rest. So we and then this entire sum was going to come off. Now, of course, we have to do the thing that is so often forgotten, which is to very carefully invert this so that we can grab the touchpad ribbon connector. It's easy. And there goes your top case stands keyboard. So here on the inside, you can see the relevant hardware. So we have our two and a half inch hard disk. Um, there is a RAM slot that is empty, so this would have been expandable. So now what we'll do is first thing here, there is a ribbon cable that goes across the top of the drive. So we need to get that taken out. Pretty easy. And then, truly before it's time, this actually uses a Lego style connector to go into the motherboard for the IDE interface. So we'll just pop that carefully. So there's the interior shot. And so we'll go ahead and we'll just set this aside for now. So now I've got our hard drive. So this does have sort of an IDE pin connector here. So you kind of, as gently as possible, we're gonna try and pull this off. Uh, there's no way to take it off really without bending those last two pins, but cool. All right, so let's get out our adapter piece here. Uh, this seems pretty straightforward. So we've got a SATA on one side and then two IDE sizes on either of the other sides. Okay, so we will have to take the drive tray off. No, I need a more substantial screwdriver. All right, we're back and better than ever. Okay, there we go. Let's connect it right up to our Windows machine just over here, hopefully something good. It's a spinning. <laughs> Shocked Windows detected it right away. So now that we've got the drive out and we know we can read it, we need to figure out our way that we're gonna dump Windows 95 back to it. Or Windows 98 rather. So first things first, we probably just wanna blow away the whole disk. Um, A, to protect any previous data that's on it, but also because it is in two partitions, um, that doesn't really help us for this purpose. So we'll go ahead into disk management and on this bad boy, we're gonna go ahead and delete this volume and then we're gonna delete this volume. There we go. Right, we'll format the whole thing. 98. Okay, do the whole 12 gigs. Now, can I just run set up? Yeah, this app, can, this app can't run. So what do we need to do? All right, so first thing we'll try is just dumping the image directly to this drive. I don't think that'll work. So we'll wait for this to finish. We'll copy over both the ISO and the files directly. Um, I had previously tried to rectify this using Rufus, so I'm not sure that that's gonna be a viable option in this case. Case here. And we're gonna need our IDE adapter. I don't think it has many more. Uh, on off cycles in its lifetime. It is extremely painful to put this on because it's just raw contacts on the back. Go ahead and we're just gonna set it in here for now, I guess real gentle because we don't know if it's gonna work. 
Weirdly hard to get it. There we go. All right. I want that. I probably need the top case. I hate running cables so much. There we go. All right. There's that. Now those are like, now that's an IR blaster. So that may not even be relevant to our interest here. But we'll need to take this all apart anyway. Again, let's grab the keyboard. Grab that there. And let's boot her up. Hard drive spinning. That's good. Good start. We've got our splash. I got no clue what it's going to prompt me with next. So that'll be interesting. Probably nothing. And of course, we didn't put the battery back in either. All right. So what do we got here? Yeah, that's fine. Check date and time. All good. Oh, that's not found. Do you get options? You don't. Okay. So that didn't work. I did have an insane idea involving a virtual machine. <laughs> Just because I don't have any hardware, I know this, this computer does not support bootable USB. So let's think. All right, so now let's go ahead and make a new virtual box. And we need to go back to Windows 98. So first thing we need to do is mount our disk file, which is right here. So that when we start, it should just go right into it. Now I'm gonna see if we can, I'm not sure we have guest extensions. It could be a real problem for me. Mm, see, in drive A, I think we're gonna go in circles here. Aha, other directory. Let's see if we can find it. And exit out of this, yeah. Let's try mounting the disk. I might confuse it. I might confuse myself. Oh, you know what? Because I can add as a share now too. All right, so. I think we've got this all set, so it should mount as a share. So let's go ahead and start it and see what we got here. And it's going to be G. Now we have no no way of knowing if that's working. We can't use that. Okay, fine. Then we'll just put it on the C drive, and then we'll try to install it from inside the OS. All right, so after a disturbingly short amount of time, uh, we're here at the setup wizard. So I'll be Brad, and we'll be from HCE. We'll accept the agreement. I need the product key, which I do have. I love that <laughs> an official response was to just turn the computer off. If, it's if it holds up, just turn it off. Yeah, why not? All right, we'll restart again. I think at this point, we're still booting from the hard disk. I'm curious, because I don't know how many CPUs I said. It's probably gonna blow up if it was more than one. But you gotta believe VirtualBox knew, <laughs> knew that you shouldn't do that. Okay, I love that. That's probably fine. So after the DLL crash, I went ahead and restarted the computer anyway, because it did say that if it gets hung, to just go ahead and restart it. And after restarting it, I've been met with the logon screen. So we'll go ahead and we'll see if it lets me get to a desktop. And it won't because the program has performed an illegal operation. <laughs> Probably because it has too many VU CPUs. But we can always just restart the computer again. Yes, okay. After some consternation and research, I used a guide found at Install Windows 98 and VirtualBox Sinness Tech Solutions to help me get past the issue with the missing DLL file and into initial configuration and eventually to the desktop. I will say at this point, I'm starting to think that the cost of the CD drive would be worth the price of admission. However, I'm far too deep now to not at least see if this is possible. But now we run into another issue. VirtualBox doesn't support their guest editions add-on in any sort of Windows 98 or Windows 2000 or Windows ME. So my idea that I was going to somehow connect the IDE drive via USB is kaput because I can't do a folder share to mount a USB device in VirtualBox while it's running a Windows 98 VM. However, 
you can use guest editions in Windows XP, which does fully support our USB devices. So we'll be able to see our USB CD drive, or of course the virtual CD drive, as well as our USB to SATA IDE connector with the original Sony IDE drive in it. So I used the unattended installation for Windows XP in VirtualBox, and I was on the virtual desktop within five minutes, and my 12-year-old self would have lost his mind, but that doesn't really help me now. And after checking that the guest extensions were installed and that the network adapter was disabled, because I just, I don't, we don't need to mess with that, I powered off the machine and attached the laptop's two and a half inch IDE drive as a shared folder to the virtual machine, hoping to have it mount and populate as a disk in XP that I could use as a target for the Windows 98 installation. Now that we have the K drive or the Sony IDE drive mounted, we run into a new problem. And that's that Windows 98 setup doesn't start from the XP GUI. It's instead looking to install via booting XP back into DOS mode. And seeing as the K drive is a network share, I have a hard time believing that the drive would be usable in that scenario. And since we're going to need to get into a DOS prompt, this might be easier if I just loaded XP onto some real local hardware. Diving into the chest of technological wares and woes, I pulled out my Am I Cool DVD-R slash RW drive. After connecting the drive to the computer, I was able to, just for some reason on the second try, insert a blank CDR and prepare to write my copy of Windows XP to it, for sacrifice on one of my older, but probably still too new, computers. Using the built-in Windows image burning tool, I set the XP ISO sights on the USB burner, and after a hesitation, the drive burst to life with some noises that brought me back to my childhood of burning LimeWire MP3s and viruses to CDs to listen to in the car. After a few attempts, though, I couldn't get that Windows XP C to load into any of my laptops, as the hardware is simply too new. In fact, though, I couldn't get any OS to boot on them, and seeing as I just moved, perhaps all of these disk drives are toast. But now we get into the real meat and potatoes of things, because I thought, even at the beginning, but now as I've exhausted most of my other options, as a last ditch, we could try converting the working VirtualBox installation of Windows 98 the VDI file into a VHD or a virtual hard disk, mount that virtual hard disk to a machine, and then use drive cloning software to attempt a one-for-one -one copy from the VHD file onto the IDE drive. Now, at first I'm thinking this may not be successful just right off the bat, right? Because we're trying to dump what's going to be a virtualized FAT32 file system onto a real FAT32 file system, but we're, we're changing interfaces and technically, you know, the host drive is NTFS. So I'm not real sure that this is gonna work, but I use this guide as a jumping off point. After converting the VDI file to a VHD image and mounting it in Windows, I opened Macrium Reflect to attempt to do a direct clone. However, Macrium Reflect failed almost immediately every time with a, sort of an undisclosed error code. Now, as with all things in life, right, sometimes things just do or don't work because it's just randomness. And so what I went ahead and did was I tried using a different drive cloning software, in this case, Acronis, to at least, you know, see if that would work. Now, the first machine I tried using the cloning software on, after a few minutes of running, Acronis would throw an error and say that there was a sector problem, right? You get like sector three or four or 5,000, and it said that it couldn't do it. And so I was thinking at this point, well, maybe the drive's cooked. But I had another machine. I have so many machines. So I tried doing the clone on a different machine and it did in fact complete the clone successfully. But even at this point, right, I'm pretty trepidatious because I just do not know if this is like a concept that is really makes any sense. And there's not a ton of documentation on this anywhere online. So I figured that either it works or it just doesn't work. <laughs> now, at first, after all of that, I was still disappointed to find that upon booting the machine, I was met with the operating system not found screen. However, I thought about it and I went through and I said, okay, well, surely if the clone worked, I wanna believe the clone worked. And I wasn't gonna give up on this because this truly was the last ditch. 
So I went into the BIOS and just reset everything to default and made sure that our hard drive was our first boot device. And sure enough, after resetting the BIOS, Windows 98. Now, although we've made it past the splash screen and towards a desktop sort of thing, we're running into an issue that I anticipated, right? Which is that we converted a virtual box device into a virtual hard disk that we then cloned. And so what we have here is the Windows 98 prompts for found new hardware, which makes perfect sense because it is not at all the same hardware that I was virtualizing on. But we're still into a little teensy bit of a problem because it still wants a Windows 98 disk. However, we can skip through all of these prompts and land on the desktop. Now, thankfully out of the box, the keyboard and mouse do work. And after canceling through all the prompts, Windows 98. I was hoping it was gonna play the song. I guess it can't play the song because there's no audio driver. So that's where we're at now. We need to go through and find all of the drivers for all of the parts for this computer. Since I fully believe that I'll be running down some websites of let's say dubious reputation, I'm using one of my older throwaway machines uh, to do this task that has nothing personal on it so that in the event that I get caught with the internet's disease, so to speak, there's nothing necessarily of importance to lose. Now, this is also the device with which I successfully cloned the VHD to the IDE drive. So this, this computer just might be more up to the task than any of my more modern hardware. Now, while I was at it, I grabbed what are hopefully working copies of SimCity 2000 and The Incredible Machine, some of my favorite Windows 98 games. But I also needed to look for recovery disks for this Sony Vio because none of the drivers, of course, are, are exist in anything. So I grabbed a Japanese version of the disk from archive.org, extracted the ISO and copied it back to the hard drive. At this point, I decided to hook up the dock connector to use a VGA monitor just to get a little better view of things and not have to squint so much to look at the very, very tiny screen. Um, and this was a lot easier to look at, even though the driver still isn't there, it's at least bigger and not so hard on the eyes. Now here you can see I'm trying to get these drivers solved and I'd actually found the correct driver for the Neomagic card that's in it, but for whatever reason it just refused to let me do any resolution higher than 640 by 480. So I went through it over and over and over again trying to get these set up, but at least it did detect over VGA the monitor that I had set up to it. At this point the computer locked. So after kind of just messing around with drivers for a little bit, I decided to go ahead and start up SimCity just to see if it actually worked. And I was greeted with a very nostalgic screen that I don't really remember. And I got into the game and then I, I realized something that was very important. And that's that I don't know how to play this game because I haven't played it in 20 years. Um, so I tried to take a City Skylines approach and just like bang out some power and some roads and some utilities. Um, and I put it into like the turbo mode and I'm already, I'm already playing it back at 500% speed, but I put it into the turbo mode and that also didn't seem to uh, solve anything. So maybe I just don't remember how to play this game. A very real possibility. After this, I tried to make sure that I could get those USB drivers working. And when connected to the dock connector, in fact, the USB drivers do work. So at this point, I was able to seal the laptop back up and let it be. So all in all, would I recommend doing this? Probably not. There are easier ways to install Windows 98 on legacy hardware. However, I think that we really went down an interesting rabbit hole on using VirtualBox as a third party installation methodology. There was no way that I was getting Windows 98 on this computer without buying that external CD drive. But by doing that clever VDI to VHD conversion and then using cloning software to get that back onto the original drive, we were able to successfully boot into Windows 98. Now, is it riddled with driver issues? Yes. Does it behave differently every single time I turn it on? Also, yes. But nonetheless, I think it's a really interesting proof of concept. And if this is something that you're looking to do, I certainly hope it's successful for you. Obviously, your mileage may vary depending on literally anything. Uh, I think that there was a lot of star alignment just for this to work. That being said, I hope that you found this interesting, helpful, entertaining, an adventure at the very least. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.